I want to tell you about one of the wildest characters in all the scriptures. I want to name some of his fatal flaws and compare them to downfalls of modern pastors, preachers, teachers. This particular character has such a God complex that he is a perfect type and picture of the Antichrist. <clears throat> and just quickly, here are some ways that King Saul foreshadows the Antichrist. Number one, his coming is prophesied in 1 Samuel 9, 16 through 17. Number two, he seems like a good guy at first. 1 Samuel 9, 21. Just like the Antichrist is going to come in peaceably. He's going to obtain the kingdom by flatteries. He's going to seem like he's here to help at first. Number three, he gets turned into another man. 1 Samuel 10, 6. Just like the Antichrist. Number four. There's none like him among all the people. 1 Samuel 10.24 Just like King Saul, King Saul was head and shoulders above everybody. The Antichrist is going to be kind of like a superman. Number 5. He did foolishly in a religious matter in 1 Samuel 13.13. 13. Watch out for the 13s. They're always connected with the Antichrist. King Saul did foolishly in that he was trying to do the job of a priest. The Antichrist is going to do foolishly in a religious matter because he's going to go in the temple claiming to be God himself. Number six, a man after God's own heart rules after him. See 1 Samuel 13, 14. That would be King David rules after Saul. King David is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ particularly a picture of Jesus Christ at the second coming. And it's very, it makes a lot of sense because King Saul pictures the Antichrist and then King David pictures the Lord Jesus Christ at the second coming. And Jesus Christ rules after the Antichrist in the millennial kingdom. King David rules after King Saul. Number seven, he wears out the saints in 1 Samuel 14, 25 through 30, just like the Antichrist is said to do in the book of Daniel. Number eight, he's a spiritual pretender. In 1 Samuel 15, 15 and 24 through 26. Number nine, he's connected with rebellion and witchcraft. In 1 Samuel 15, 23. Number 10, he would kill the Lord's prophet. In 1 Samuel 16, 2. Just like the Antichrist will kill the two witnesses. Moses and Elijah. With that being said, let's begin with these fatal flaws of King Saul, the narcissist king. Number one, his first biggest problem, his failure in equipping the people. Look at 1 Samuel 13, 19 through 22. 1 Samuel 13, Verse 19 through 22. It says, Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, Lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share, and his coulter, and his axe, and his mattock. Yet they had a file for the mattocks, and for the coulters, and for the forks, and for the axes, and to sharpen the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people that were with Saul and Jonathan, but with Saul and with Jonathan his son was there found. And the garrison of the Philistines went out to the passage of Michmash. So you see, only in the hand of Saul and Jonathan was there a sword. Saul is a horrible leader who can't equip his men. Saul and his son Jonathan were the only two men of Israel with a sword. So what happened? The rest of the people found themselves without a sword. No smith was found throughout Israel. They just had a file for the axes and for the forks and coulters and mattocks. 
They weren't equipped with swords for the battle. That's, so Saul, he pictures a lazy or just a downright no good pastor for today. He's not equipping his people with the sword. Look at Psalm 149 and verse 6. It says, let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. You want to equip the people with the sword. But Saul had a failure in equipping the people with the sword. So is the case in most churches. The pastor has his sword, and he knows a thing or two about using it. However, for numerous reasons, he doesn't equip the people with their sword. And what's, what's the Word of God likened to? A sword, Hebrews 4.12, for the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is your sword. And you need to equip the people with the sword. Don't be like King Saul and only have it yourself. Just you and your closest person, your son, your daughter, your wife. You need to equip all the people with it. You see, most sermons today are filled with personal stories, personal illustrations, cliches, they're missing a key thing. Paul said, preach the word in 2 Timothy 4.2. Jesus, what did he do when he preached? In Luke 24.27, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He expounded the scriptures. Paul preached the word. Uh, pastors and their scriptureless preaching causes Christians to walk through their life weaponless. They have no, no assurance of salvation. They have no rebuttals for cults. They have no comfort in their sorrows. They have no meat to grow in grace and no desire for doctrine. The less doctrine you get, the less you're going to desire it. They don't miss what they never had and they stay just spiritual babies. They never grow. You have to have the doctrine to grow. So Saul's first problem, his failure in equipping the people. So they found themselves without a, without a sword. They had forks and axes, but forks and axes don't cut the same. In 1 Samuel 13, 20 through 21, they had their forks and their axes. But Saul seemed to have his dispensations crossed. Israel had farming equipment. Instead of swords. That's like Israel is going to have in the millennium. In Isaiah 2.4. The Lord's going to beat their swords into plowshares. And their spears into pruning hooks. But at this moment in 1 Samuel 13. They needed their sword. They needed to be fighting. They needed to be ready to fight. Saul greatly resembles the modern pastor. Who has his dispensations all mixed up. He was supposed to be fighting for the kingdom. With the sword and training his people to fight for the kingdom with the sword. He didn't do much of that. Israel was having to fight without a sword. David had to cut off Goliath's head with Goliath's own sword for this reason. I also think of the modern pastor who doesn't have enough sense to know what the sword is. Everyone in the pew has a weapon that doesn't cut the same. The forks and axes, they just don't don't cut the same as as it would have if they had them, had them a sword. You know, the NIV and the RSV and the NKJV and the ASV and the NLT just doesn't draw blood like a AV-1611. And that's what they're using today. Somebody said it's like shaving with a banana. Jeremiah 48, 10, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. Maybe I'm just biased, but you hear a, a pastor using a, a modern version and quoting verses. It just doesn't cut the same. And he's failing in equipping the people with the sword. They just got forks and axes. I heard a man telling his congregation to be excited about the Word of God, but he was using multiple versions in the sermon. 
He didn't realize it's hard to get people excited about something in which he teaches that they can't have 100% faith in. He's not equipping them with the sword. Saw his failure in equipping the people. He found They found themselves without a sword. They found out the forks and axes just don't cut the same. And then Saul had them fasting in a time of battle. In 1 Samuel 14, 24, check this out. In 1 Samuel 14, 24, it says, And the men of Israel were distressed that day. For Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed be the man that eateth any food until evening, that I may be avenged on mine enemies, so none of the people tasted any food. Now look at verse 33. Then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people sin against the Lord in that day. Eat with the blood. And he said, Ye have transgressed. Roll a great stone unto me this day. So see what happened? He had them fasting in a time of battle. And look what it ended up to there. Saul proclaims a foolish fast during a time when the people greatly needed to eat. Compared to the modern pastor who's basically calling a fast from the Word of God because he won't crack the book open. Even though the words are more important than our necessary food. Just like Job said in Job 23.12, I've esteemed the words of God more than my necessary food. So most pastors have caused a self-inflicted famine of hearing the words of God. Amos 8.11 refers to this, a famine of hearing the words of God. People are spiritually starved to death. Their, their pastors basically called for a, fa a fast of the word of God. They don't have a fountain to drink from and he won't lead the horses to the water. When Jonathan broke the fast and took a little of the honey in 1 Samuel 14, 29, his eyes were enlightened. Just like when a saint finds a good Bible teacher or preacher, then they realize there is more to Christianity than don't do this and don't do that and don't eat that. You see, honey is like the Word of God and the saint needs honey for the journey. Look at Ezekiel 3 and verse 3. You see, Jonathan, he didn't hear about Saul's proclaiming of that fast. And he got a little honey, and his eyes were enlightened. What happened? Saul was angry. Just like today, you get a saint, and he, he, maybe he stumbles upon a Bible preacher or something somewhere, and he begins to learn a wor the Word of God. All of a sudden, the people at his church don't even like him anymore. The pastor doesn't like him anymore. They get intimidated by him because he's found the honey. In Ezekiel 3, 3, it says, And he said unto me, Son of man, cause thy belly to eat and fill thy bowels with this roll that I give thee. Then did I eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. You see, the word of God is like honey. It's your spiritual food. In Revelation 10, 9, John said, And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. In 1 Samuel fourteen twenty nine, Jonathan got a hold of that honey. And it says, Then said Jonathan, My father hath troubled the land. See, I pray you, how mine eyes have been enlightened, because I tasted a little of this honey. That's what the word of God will do for you, just tasting a little of it. It'll give you honey for the journey. But Saul, his failure in equipping the people, they found themselves without a sword. They found out forks and axes don't cut the same. He had them fasting in the day of battle. But now number two, the next thing about King Saul, he was filled with an evil spirit. Look at 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 15. 1 Samuel 16, 14 through 15. It says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. He lost the Holy Spirit. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. That's how you know that they didn't have the same 
type of situation in the Old Testament as they do today because Saul lost the spirit. Me and you can't lose the spirit. But he lost the spirit and an evil spirit troubled him. Saul is plagued by an evil spirit and David has to come play on and harp to drive it away. So he's filled with an evil spirit and this evil spirit is from the Lord. 1 Samuel 16, 14. The evil spirit is from God himself and the Lord will use the devil and his henchmen to judge a man's rebellion. You see, Saul shows all the signs of a devil-possessed narcissist maniac. One time he even stripped off his clothes and prophesied in 1 Samuel 19.24. And what did it say about the, the maniac of Gadar in Luke 8.27? It says he wore no clothes. I believe false teachers and pastors are a judgment from God on the country, a country who has been rejecting the words of God for so long. So a lying spirit is sent in the mouth of of these televangelists, of these cult leaders, of these mega church pastors across the nation. Just like in 1 Kings 22, 23. Remember what happened in 1 Kings 22? In 1 Kings 22, 23, it says, Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. The Lord will use the lying spirit and the mouth of a false teacher or false prophet as a judgment on a country for rejecting his words. So if Saul's filled with an evil spirit. This evil spirit is from the Lord, and Saul is forsaken by the Holy Spirit. In 1 Samuel 16, 14, the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Saul is not only plagued by an evil spirit, but lost the Holy Spirit. You see, today the child of God cannot lose the Holy Spirit. We're sealed until the day of redemption, according to Ephesians 4.30. But compare Saul to the modern pastor today. If he is saved, he can't lose the Holy Spirit. But since he's gone in another direction and won't darken the door of the King James Bible, his message is a motivational pep talk at best. Since he won't crack open the book, he doesn't have anything from the Lord. And Saul couldn't get anything from the Lord or from a prophet even, or in a dream, or by Urim. He ends up going to the witch at Endor in an attempt to get something. In 1 Samuel 28, 6 through 8. And see, the modern pastor, he ends up, he, he can't get nothing from the Lord because he won't crack open the book. He can't, he's, got, he's caused a spiritual famine of the Word of God in his church and the places he's going to get something is like the Witch of Endor. To get a message, he's going to Facebook, he's going to Fox News, he's going to TikTok for the message. He then begins to rely on his own spirit through entertaining stories, illustrations, sensationalism, charisma, all because he won't let the text do the talking. There are 1,189 chapters to feast on with at least three applications for each one. So give the people a feast before their battle, not a fast. Give them a feast before the battle, not a fast. <clears throat> but what do you got that's all about? You'll find they're always talking about Trump, always talking about just situations that's going on, never about the Word of God. Number three, Saul fears man. He fell, failed in equipping the people. He was filled with an evil spirit. The evil spirit was from the Lord. He was forsaken by the Holy Spirit, and he fears man. In 1 Samuel 17, 25, and chapter 18, 12 through 15, you see that he fears man. And I don't remember hearing about Saul facing off against any tough guys or giants or hundreds of men at once like David or David's mighty men. But you do find him sitting under pomegranate trees where when others are fighting. In 1 Samuel 14, 2 and 22, 6, you'll find him sitting under a pomegranate tree. The truth is that Saul feared man. So if he feared man, facing the champion was a no-go. In 1 Samuel 17, 25, Look at 1 Samuel 17, 25. It says, And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? 
surely to defy Israel as he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. So Saul wasn't going to fight Goliath, the champion. Facing the champion for him was a no-go. He was going to, who, whoever was brave enough to go fight him and beat him, he was going to give him his daughter and everything else. Saul was offering his own daughter and great riches to any man who would kill Goliath. Well, why wouldn't Saul fight Goliath himself? If you're the leader, shouldn't you want to have to take on the toughest battle? If you don't want to, want to be like Saul, then face your giant. Just like Saul, many pastors believe they are so far above the sheep. And what Israel needed was a man like David who would protect the sheep and kill the lion and the bear. And the uncircumcised giant Philistine who will be just another foreskin for the collection. You see. But Saul was much different than David. Facing the champion was a no-go. Saul was afraid of wicked men who looked mean and tough. At the same time, he was afraid of righteous men who probably didn't look tough, like David. So facing the champion was a no-go, and he was frightened by the character of David. In 1 Samuel eighteen twelve through 15, it says, And Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him, and was departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him, and made him his captain over a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, because he went out and came in before them. He was just wanting David to go out and fight and get killed. He was frightened by the character of David. Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. And because he behaved himself wisely. There's something intimidating about holiness. This is why John was so overwhelmed by the holiness of God and fell at his feet as dead. So when you live holy and you show people that you're for the Lord, there's, they're intimidated by you in many ways. Saul lost the Holy Spirit. He didn't have that no more. David had it. And he was frightened by David. Saul was afraid David was going to get the limelight. I mean, they were already making songs about David, and uh, Saul couldn't stand it. In 1 Samuel 18, 7, it says, The women answered one another as they played and said, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands. So they were accrediting more to David than they were to Saul. He was afraid David was going to get the limelight. Saul had to have the limelight. He was just like Diotrephes and Third John, who loveth to have the preeminence. You see, many times an egomaniac pastor would try to drive out great Bible-believing men in the church because he is afraid they would steal his shine. All right, number four. Another fatal flaw of Saul is he's fixated on himself. In 1 Samuel 15, 17... 1 Samuel 15, 17. And Samuel said, When thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. So at one time, Saul was little in his own sight. Now look at 1 Samuel 17, 38. It says, And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head, and he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and essayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said to Saul, Can I go with these? For I have not proved them. And David put them off him. You see that? He tried to, he was fixing out on himself. He tried to put his own armor on David. Samuel told Saul, When thou was little in thine own sight. But Saul began to be puffed up in his mind, and this led to his demise. So he's fixated on himself. He's got false armor, though. In 1 Samuel 17, 38 through 39, he tried to give David his armor. Saul was so fixated on himself that he thought his own armor would do the trick for David in battle. 
But David took off Saul's armor because he had the armor of the Lord. That's all he needed. David knew it had to be the Lord to deliver him. Saul's armor was his own self-righteousness. He was no longer little in his own sight. He is an illustration of Proverbs 16, 18, which says, Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. He thought his own armor could save David. If his own armor were so good, why didn't he put his own armor on himself and go out and face the champion? But he forces his way on others. He's got false armor. And you see, he forced his ways on David. Saul giving David his armor can picture how a pastor thinks his way of doing things will work for everybody. So he pushes his convictions and hobby horses on the people, thinking it will give them the victory. This could be in the form of whatever the pastor's thing is. Street preaching, excessive soul winning, insane amounts of Bible reading or any other type of service he thinks that a man has to do to be considered spiritual. But the Lord lays different burdens on different people. But he can get so fixated on himself, so puffed up in his mind, he thinks that his thing is the only thing that will make you spiritual and close to God. So Saul, he's fixated on himself. He's got false armor. He forces his way on others. The number five, he's got fake spirituality. 1 Samuel 18, 17. 1 Samuel 18, 17. And Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter Mereb, her will I give thee to wife. Only be thou valiant for me, and fight the Lord's battles. For Saul said, Let not mine hand be upon him, but let the hand of the Philistines be upon him. So notice, he's not out looking out for David. He's wanting David's demise, but he's pretending that he's for David. He's got fake spirituality. Saul told David to be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. Sounding so pious and like just some great, great man of God. But secretly, he, has, he was hoping that David would die in battle. He didn't care about the Lord and the Lord's battles. Don't you just hate it when Somebody brings God into something to try and manipulate you with God. He's got fake spirituality. You see, favors from him are really favors for him. He's a true narcissist. You ever get around people who they pretend that they're doing you a favor, but it's really doing them a favor? Favors from them are really favors for them. In 1 Samuel 18, 18 through 29... It says, And David said unto Saul, Who am I, and what is my life for my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? You see, David's humble. He's like, Why should I be son-in-law to the king? But it came to pass at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given Adriel the Maholathite to wife. And Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give him her, that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. See that? He's only given Michael to David, not as a favor, not because he loves David. He's given Michael to David to be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou shalt this day be my son-in-law and the one of the twain. And Saul commanded his servants, saying, Commune with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king hath delight in thee, and all his servants love thee. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. See, he's pretending to do him a favor. And Saul's servants spake those words in the ears of David, and David said, Seemeth it to you a light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing that I am a poor man and lightly esteemed See David's view of himself compared to Saul's view of himself, how different it is. And the servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner spake David. And Saul said, Thus shall ye say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but an hundred foreskins of the Philistines, to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. See, Saul just said, well, I just want him to get a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. 
but he was really wanting him to die in battle. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines two hundred men, and brought their foreskins. So he brought double what Saul asked for, and they gave them in full tale to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. And Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife, and Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David, and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. And Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was much set by. So you see, Saul had fake spirituality. Favors from him are really favors for him. Pretending to do David a favor. Saul was pretending to do David a favor by giving him his daughter Michael. But he was only giving her to be a snare unto David. He asked for a hundred Philistine foreskins in the hopes that David would die in the mission. Many times the egomaniac, self-righteous, narcissistic pastor will do many favors in exchange for people's promotion. And not because he has a heart for the people. This is the wrong motive. Sometimes a pastor can get someone, set someone up for failure by pushing them out into things they aren't ready for. Unlike David in the story, who was ready for the battle, sometimes they get pushed out into the battle and they get consumed in the battle. That was Saul's master plan for David. So favors from Saul are really favors for Saul. The next thing, he fights for himself while claiming to fight the Lord's battle. You see, he told David, be valiant for me and fight the Lord's battle in 1 Samuel eighteen seventeen, Saul continuously claims to be fighting the Lord's battles, but every effort is all for the purpose of making himself look better and be in a preeminent place. You see, many of the big shot men of God today will be left at the judgment seat of Christ empty-handed because the fire will try every man's work of what sort it is. 1 Corinthians 3.13. What was their motive for doing it? Was he really doing it to fight the Lord's battles as he claims, or was he doing it for himself, doing favors for himself? All the visitation and the soul winning and the Bible reading and all the numbers... We're all in an effort to fulfill some fantasy of being the greatest. Just like the, the disciples, they were, in Mark 9, 34, they were talking about who would be the greatest. So he fights for himself while claiming to fight for the Lord. All right, the sixth thing. Saul, full of murder. He was full of murder. 1 Samuel 18, 10 through 11. 1 Samuel 18, 10 through 11, it says, And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God, it, that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. So you see that? He was full of murder. Look at verse 25, 1 Samuel 18, 25. And Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desireth not any dowry, but a hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged to the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. He thought, If I can't kill him, I'm going to have the enemy kill him. Now look at 1 Samuel 19, 10. In 1 Samuel 19, 10, And Saul sought to smite David even to the wall with the javelin, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he smote the javelin into the wall, and David, David fled and escaped that night. So he tried to kill David again. Look at 1 Samuel 22, 16 through 19. 1 Samuel 22, 16 through 19. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Himelech. Thou and all thy father's house. And the king said unto the footman that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew when he fled and did not show it to me. 
But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. And the king said to Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priests. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priests, and slew on that day fourscore and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen and asses and sheep with the edge of the sword. So you see how much murder was in Saul's heart. Maybe the fact that Saul was filled with an evil spirit caused this. He was filled with envy, and he was in his enormous ego. This all helped fuel his desire for murder. So he's full of murder, and for envy, he sought to slay David. David is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they also thought to slay the Lord for envy in Matthew 27, 18. You see, Saul couldn't deal with the women singing, Saul hath slain his thousands, and David his ten thousands, in 1 Samuel 18, 7. Imagine Satan's anger over the saints singing victory in Jesus. He can't take it. It's no different today as modern-day pastors seek to slay a man with their tongue, James 3, 8. In James 3, 8, it says, But the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison, and men use that to slay each other. It's all out of envy for another man's ministry. Modern pastors will do that. Some men have a ministry of destroying other people's ministries, so all their sermons become a javelin aimed at another pastor. So for envy, he sought to slay David. He fell upon the priests with the sword in 1 Samuel twenty two sixteen through 19. In 1 Samuel twenty two seventeen, 17, it calls them priests of the Lord. But Saul has them killed. Saul certainly isn't fighting the Lord's battles. He's fighting against God. I think of pastors today using the sword against preachers of the Lord. Whose side are they really on? They are preaching Christ of envy and strife. Philippians 1.15. Their sermons ooze with hatred and envy for others. And what does it make you if you hate your brother, according to 1 John 3.15? In 1 John 3.15, it says, Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and he know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So King Saul, full of murder, for envy he sought to slay David. He fell upon the priests with the sword. But King Saul has all the fatal flaws of someone who is headed for destruction. He ends up falling upon a sword. He commits suicide in 1 Samuel 31, 4. You see, many pastors get lifted up in pride and the devil kicks them backwards onto their own sword. We can't please God unless we stay little in our own sight. Be more like a David in the story. And stay away from Saul's fatal flaws.